Do you need to find a skeleton? How would you tell people that design? You personally, how would you tell that design? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on this. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here, with the first update for Phase 3 for the Speculative Evolution Project. We've got 8 creatures, most created by fans, but at least one by me. I don't want to stand on ceremony, so let's just get into the descriptions. First up, we have Aquatuberus. Aquatuberus has evolved to live in wetlands, coastal regions, marshes, and swamps. Here it has evolved to withstand the strong currents of the tides and the rise and fall of the water table. Because of these strange habitats, it has evolved some strange features that aren't found in more stable habitats. It has evolved wide cone-like leaves that catch water and nutrients when the tide drops, and where it can catch water in dry times. It has a large tuber which acts as an anchor and stores nutrients, and it reproduces by growing a hollow seed that can get carried away by the currents and easily settle in new habitats. Creature Design by Kipzilla Aquatuberus is made up of five parts, the roots, the tuber, the stem, the leaves, and the head. Aquatuberus has a large root system that has two purposes. They withstand the strong currents in tidal affected areas, and they take in nutrients from the ground in which it is settled. They grow mostly wide and not very deep to gather as many nutrients as it can get in the poor soil in which it grows. The tuber is a large part of the plant and is where the plant grows from. It has two purposes, storage of nutrients and weighing down the plant. Inside of the tuber is a hollow area that never fills with any organic material. This hollow area is a leftover from the seed where it grows. It uses this hollow as an area to increase buoyancy. The stem is a hard connected part of the plant. It connects the tuber to the leaves and is rigid. Inside the stem is a nutrient transport system. The leaves are the main productive part of the plant. They are near the top of the water surface, or sometimes they stick out a little bit. They are septicons, or seven-sided, and are supported by small mid-stems that grow in seven directions and support the leaf. They are shaped in a wide cone which traps water and nutrients at high tide and catches sunlight at low tide. The head is on the end of the stem. This is the area where the new seeds grow from. When the plant is not growing any seed, it serves no purpose. Aquatuberus will grow a corm from its head when it is ready to reproduce. This corm, or seed, has the same genetic code as the parent itself. When the parent plant is four months old and it has leaves, it will grow a head onto the stem, which will allow for corms to grow. Typically, it only has one head where one corm at a time can grow from. But when the stems accidentally split, there is a small chance that multiple heads can grow. The corms are hollow on the inside to increase buoyancy, which will allow it to float and drift to other areas. At four months old, aquatuberus will grow a head from which a corm will grow. When it's fully developed, it will get loose and attach the moment the next flood or high tide rolls in. Then the corm will get taken away by the sea and wind and settle down somewhere where the currents or winds aren't as strong. When the corm is settled, it sprouts roots from the bottom end, which will keep it in place and the stem will grow out from the top end. These will grow larger and larger and it will grow buds, which will grow to about 10 centimeters large and then fold open into its leaves. It will then grow to about 250 centimeters long, with leaves which are near the surface of the water sticking out far above the water. After four months of growing, it will develop a head in the middle of the stem and start making corms for the next generation, repeating the cycle. Aquatuberus grows in wetlands, swamps, marshes, intertidal zones, river miles, and deltas, and in lowland areas with extreme amounts of rainfall, where their roots are 75% of the time submerged. It grows and spreads around the world, except for colder regions, where the frost will damage the plant. Aquatuberus can sense drought. When this happens, it will let its leaves fall off, and go into a drought hibernation. However, the moment water returns, it will go back to its normal life and regrow the fallen leaves. Genetic ancestor? Wartmelon. Scientific name? Caratobos aquatuberus. Origin? Retinal phyta. Lifespan? 5 years, 10 in stable climates, only a few in unstable climates. Average height? 250 centimeters. Average length? Tuber is around 75 centimeters wide. Next up, we have the armor globe. Descended from basal filter globes, the armor globe has adapted to deal with a large radiation of predators caused by the gaps left at the end of the first mass extinction on Almaisha. The armor globe became a generalist omnivore that lived in shallow waters. It is covered in a thick armored exoskeleton. This adaptation has hampered the armor globe's ability to swim, and to compensate, it lived among the purple plant life to camouflage itself. Pictured here, an armor globe approaches a patch of primitive retinal fight. Creature design by Saurus Blood. Armor globes retain the radial symmetry of their filter globe ancestors externally. Internally, though, a clear anterior and posterior side has begun to form. On the anterior side, the stomach forms a second chamber where waste material is stored, allowing for food to be more efficiently processed before waste is regurgitated. On the posterior side, a reproductive tube has formed, which contains the gametes and allows for the development of eggs. Externally, the armor globe became more compact compared to its ancestors and conversely involved an armored exterior like the extinct Pelongigida. The armor globe's exoskeleton does not grow with the animal and needs to be shed at least once every local year. 
To shed the calcium carbonate skeleton, the ancestral method of swimming has been repurposed. When it was ready to molt, an armor globe would inflate its gill sacs, causing the armored bell to separate from the body, allowing the armor globe to easily pull itself out of its old exoskeleton. The armor globe would take on average a half hour for its new exoskeleton to fully solidify. It would be quite vulnerable to predators during this time, so it would often take shelter under rocks or behind plants until the process is complete. The mouth of an armor globe has formed a four-jointed hardened mouth part used to masticate food. Its eyes grew larger and are superior to the ancestral filter globe. Though they have poor depth perception, they can see in a much wider range of colors and are very sensitive to movement. Armor globes were hermaphrodites like their ancestors, though they have done away with broadcast spawning in favor of a more direct method that ensures more chances of fertilization. When two armor globes were going to breed, they produced a mucous membrane that would contain the male gametes and exchange them. The receiving armor globe would ingest the bag of gametes into its reproductive tube. Within seven local days, 80 to 100 eggs will be produced based on the abundance of food. The eggs are wrapped in a mucous membrane and regurgitated. The adult would then place the egg sac in a hidden location, either under a rock or plant, the sticky mucus keeping it from being washed away. Armor globes would mate on average twice a local year. Young armor globes emerge from their eggs as miniature versions of adults and will subsist primarily on plant matter until they reach a height of 5 centimeters and begin to diversify their diet. This generally took 3 to 4 local months. After their first local year, they would be breeding size. The average lifespan of an armor globe would be 8 local years. Armor globes live in shallow warm waters of southern Yama and Kubshai, with a sizable population living in the Yama Natash major reef system. They will often be found living on or around purple vegetation and corals. Armor globes are omnivores and would feed on both plants and carrion. They would partake in hunting behavior if there is something they can trap with their legs and jaws, though it was much less common. Abandoned armor globe exoskeletons were often taken by other species to be repurposed. One such species are fortress mites, who use the discarded exoskeletons to build their hives. Genetic ancestor, filter globe. Scientific name, Arma orbis purpura. Origin, Xena radiata. Lifespan, 8 local years. Average height, 14 centimeters. All right, now we have the dive bell. With the fall of many large predators in the ecosystem, more of a great radiation of predators have evolved to take the top spot of Phase 3's oceans. Some ecoglobes were too slow and soft-bodied to compete with the new predators in the seas around Cha Tang. To survive, they developed a hard shell around the main body. The name dive bell was attributed to their defensive tactic. When threatened by a predator, the dive bell will pull its tentacles into its armored body and close its armored eyelids. While in this sealed state, the dive bell will sink to the bottom. Dive bells were predators who fed primarily on small animals, and many have taken to feeding on parasites who afflict the larger species that have evolved. Their tentacles have adapted to hold on to these larger species and use specialized clawed tentacles to pull off parasites. Here, a drawing by noted paleo artist Sean Ring depicts two dive bells, one alarmed and one at ease. Actually, the creature design was by Source Blood, and Sean Draws did the art. You can find Sean Draws at, at Sean 25470265 on Twitter if you want some awesome art. Internally, the dive bell hasn't really changed much from its ecoglobe ancestors. The main developments are external, primarily with the calcium carbonate shell that covers the main body. The shell is durable and grows with the animal as it ages. A unique feature to this species is the development of armored eyelids that will close when the animal feels threatened. They develop from the ancestral pseudostalks of the ancestral ecoglobe. The tentacles' appendages moved further down the tentacles and have reduced in size. On tentacles 3, 4, 7, and 8, they have become thin and barbed to hold onto the larger creatures it tends to. Tentacles 1, 2, 5, and 6 have developed two small digit graspers, formed from the fusing of the appendages used for the catching of prey or pulling parasites off of other creatures. The tentacles are capable of retracting into the bell. They will coil in on themselves, but unlike the eyes, the space in which they retreat lacks any covering to completely seal off the shell. Similar to its ancestor, the ecoglobe, the dive bell would retain gametes until it can find a potential mate, then expel its gametes. Though unlike the ecoglobe, who kept them caught in the tentacles, dive bells kept the gametes within the shell, in the space where the tentacles would retract. When mating season arrived, dive bells would cluster together and release the gametes in close proximity to ensure fertilization. Cloning is still possible, though, but it's much less common. Dive bells are born shellless, but are visually indistinguishable from their adults besides size. Juveniles would remain with adults while their shells form and harden, often taking refuge within the shells of adults, should predators approach. After two to three local months, the offspring would be fully formed and the offspring would swim off on their own. The average lifespan for a dive bell would be 10 local years. Dive bells are opportunistic carnivores that were quite comfortable feeding on anything smaller than themselves. Feeding on parasites of larger species allowed them to increase their dispersal and have an easily exploited food source. Dive bells lived in the shallows around Kubshai. They were more tolerant of changes in water temperature than their ancestors, 
but their reliance on the migration patterns of larger species has caused their range to be limited to the shallows of one continent. Diefel's eyesight improved compared to its ancestors, as the armored lids help limit the amount of light that will enter the eye, protecting it from brighter lights and allowing it to focus its vision. Diefels were found to live on various large-bodied species such as Magnospina, Megacaris, and even carnivorous killer bottles. Genetic ancestor? Ecoglobe. Scientific name? Urinanola harinosum. Origin? Xenoradiata. Lifespan? 10 local years. Average height? 30 centimeters for the main body, and 30 centimeters for the tentacles. Now we come to Fortress Mesa. In the wake of the mass extinction and the loss of the large predators, the diminutive Minospinas were forced to adapt to deal with the influx of predators competing to fill the niche of top predator. Some groups of Minospina developed a taste for carrion as opposed to their original sugar-based diet. This dietary change and the threat of new predators led to the evolution of a new species, the Fortress Mesa. Fortress Mesas were a nocturnal scavenger who lived in large eusocial colonies ruled over by a dominant fertile pair. Their name is derived from the fact that they would construct large structures formed by gluing together discarded shells and exoskeletons. These structures are made to look like the surrounding corals of their reef habitat. Pictured here, a group of Fortress Mesa are hiding out of their nest for a foraging run. Creature design by Saurus Blood. The front appendages evolved to be more of a cutting appendage as well as a grasping one, lacking the spines of its ancestral appendages in favor of a more cutting edge. The antennae have grown large and more triangular at the tips. The triangular growths are translucent and store the bioluminescent bacteria the Fortress Mesas use for communication. They activate the bioluminescence by shaking the antennae. The eyes have also grown to double the size of the ancestral Minospina. The tube-like mouth has become much longer and more needle-like. While not in use, it folds to the ventral side of the head. Internally, though, is where the majority of the changes have occurred. The Fortress Mesa stomach evolved into three separate chambers, each positioned vertically above one another. The lower stomach is used for digestion and is connected to the anus. The secondary and largest stomach is used for storage and is referred to as the social stomach. The third is the smallest and is used to convert food into a sticky paste for the Fortress Mesa, which they would use to help construct the hive. Fortress Mesas use sexual reproduction, but only the royals are capable of reproduction. Male and female royals will leave their home hive the day after a storm and will begin their search for royals from other colonies. Once two have paired off, they will search for an abandoned exoskeleton to repurpose as the beginning of their hive. The female will lay her eggs and the male will fertilize them. The initial batch of workers will be fed off the royal's energy reserves, and the success of this first batch of workers will often determine the survival of the colony. For the first 80 to 90 days, the royals will be able to breed once per week. Once the colony is fully established, production accelerates to once every three days. Royals produce between 10 and 30 eggs each clutch, depending on nutrition. A fortress mesa emerged from its egg as a nymph, a miniature version of an adult. Depending on the amount of nutrition provided to the nymph, it will grow into a reproductive royal or a worker in one week. Nymphs are not born with bioluminescent bacteria and gain them through contact with adults. Fortress mesas live exclusively in reef systems between Kubshai and Yama, as they can only disguise their colonies by imitating the corals. Fortress mesas feed on carrion or organisms on the brink of death. They will inject their digestive juices into soft flesh, liquefying it for consumption. The fortress mesa will then either digest the material on site or divert it to its social stomach and return the food to the hive. Fortress mesas are eusocial and cooperate to construct their hives and locate food sources. When two separate hives interact, members of either hive will begin flashing their bioluminescence in an attempt to intimidate the other hive to leave the area. Violence between hives is non-existent. Fortress mesas display complicated behavior with simple communication between members of the hive using the flashing of bioluminescence on their antennae. Though it is limited to warning signals and to follow signals, the construction of their hives is also evidence of some complicated behavior. The Fortress Mesa's eyes have become larger and more sensitive to light. Fortress Mesa's will often repurpose discarded exoskeletons from armor globes to help build their hives. Genetic ancestor, Minospina. Scientific name, Furiomisa hyperithros. Origin, Paleotagmato. Lifespan, 10 local years for royals, 2 local months for workers. Average height, 1.5 centimeters. Average length, 2 centimeters. The red coloration of Fortress Mesa's helps them remain hidden during the night. Next up is Magnospina. Magnospina has evolved to match the amount of substrate plants due to the recent extinction of most previous large predators. The warmer climate made it able to grow to extremely large sizes. Pictured here, a Magnospina frigus walks on the rocks above a Sargrasso field, creature designed by Kipsila. Magnospina represent their ancestors a lot. The general body shape, internal layout, etc. are really similar. Notable changes are the larger size, longer antennae, more shell covering the body, a new stomach extension called the gas stomach which fills with digestive gases and gives extra buoyancy. Also notable is the change of the spiracles which now also serve a second purpose, mating. Females will choose their males by power and the color of their spiracles. Magnospina still reproduce almost the same as Durospina. 
Females will release their pheromones when they are ready to mate. Every mating season, the dominant male in the herd will cast every potential rival out of his herd and dig a large hole where all the females can release their eggs. After they let their eggs loose, the male will release his gametes and cover the hole back up. If a rival male shows up during the mating season, they will have a fight which resembles a human wrestling match, resulting in the stronger male gaining the right to reproduce. After the mating season, the herd will move on and the rival males will be allowed back into the herd. Magnuspina has multiple stages over the course of its life. It begins as an egg, then it grows to a wanderer, then into an adult, and if it lives long enough, it will end up as a walker. After the mating happens, the eggs will form from the male and female gametes. They will stay in the hole and grow to a size of one centimeter. At that point, the infant will break out of its egg and dig itself in from the hole. When it first climbs out of the hole, its size is about one centimeter and resembles its ancestor, Diomisa. During the wanderer phase, it will stay in the general area around its birthplace, where it will grow up to 50 centimeters. When it reaches 50 centimeters, its shell will slowly harden and become more sturdy. After this growth, it will join up with an existing herd of Magnuspina, or make up one of its own with its fellow wanderers. The moment a Magnuspina becomes fertile, it is an adult. It will follow its herd or lead one of its own if it's able to overthrow the original herd leader by sheer power. They also first migrate north and south as adults, leaving their birthplace and joining up with the yearly Magnuspina trek. When Magnuspina become too old, they become a walker. It won't be able to keep up with the herds and it will be too weak to migrate in the yearly trek. Because of this, it will stay around the equator where it lives out the rest of its life until its death. Magnuspinas live all over the world in the shallow seas where they feed on substrate growing plants and only enter deeper water to scavenge for the yearly trek. Every species of Magnuspina lives around their own habitat, and they rarely enter each other's habitats. Magnuspina frigus lives on the east coast of Kupchai and around Arctica. Magnuspina tropicus lives in the shallow seas between Yama and Kupchai. Magnuspina niala lives around Nilan and doesn't have a yearly trek, and uses sulfur dioxide instead of stomach gas for extra buoyancy. Magnuspina yamayus lives on the northwest coast of Yama. Magnuspina is an herbivore. They live on roots and stems and tubers and low-hanging leaves of substrate-growing plants. They move as a herd and eat an area barren before they move on to the next area, and then on and on and on. Magnuspina live in loose herds with a dominant male as leader. He will cast out any rival male before mating season, but there are always challengers for the right to mate. The rest of the year the male and females help each other with only protection. Grazing happens individually and Magnuspina that are too slow are left behind. The male must maintain the support of the females, however, and some may break off to follow a large and brightly colored male. Genetic ancestor, Durospina. Scientific name, Magnuspina species. Origin, Paleotagmata. Lifespan, Magnuspina frigus, 15 local years. M. tropicus, 12 local years. M. niala, 6 local years. And M. yamius, 10 local years. Average height, 150 centimeters for Magnuspina frigus. 145 centimeters for M. tropicus. 100 centimeters for M. niala. And 125 centimeters for M. yamius. Average length, 300 centimeters for M. frigus. 300 centimeters for M. tropicus. 200 centimeters for M. niala and 275 centimeters for M. yamayus. All species of Magnuspina have separate colorings and spherical markings. Now we come to Sargrasso. Sargrasso is a simple and ubiquitous feature of the ancient oceans of Maomaisha some 450 million years ago. Creature designed by Dapper Dinosaur. The anatomy of Sargrasso is radically simplified. It consists of a rhizoid, a stalk, and a simple leaf-like structure. The stalk does not branch and this gives it the look of a purple grass under the ocean. Sargrasso can spread rapidly through vegetative reproduction, where the rhizoid extends horizontally and then sends up new stalks. They also give off haploid spores, which when combining with other haploid spores, will develop into a new colony of Sargrasso if conditions are right. This happens usually at night, about every six days for each stand. Because some stands of Sargrasso may become desynchronized, this may lead to sympatric speciation of Sargrasso if the desynchronization is persistent. From a spore, it only takes a few local days for the first shoot of Sargrasso to sprout, and from there it will spread. A new stalk will form every few days as long as the substrate contains enough minerals and other nutrients, and the sunlight provides sufficient energy. In ideal conditions, a Sargrasso stand can nearly double in size in a day, making it one of the fastest growing autotrophs. As a result, numerous herbivores rely on Sargrasso for a regular supply of food. Sargrasso forms the base of many food webs, but it is also highly sensitive to environmental disturbance. For example, if a flood washes extra sediment into an area, the loss of light for a few days can cause a widespread die-off of Sargrasso. Similarly, they have very low resistance to environmental toxins. Of course, they can also be cleared out by overconsumption from organisms like Magnospina. Sargrasso is found everywhere enough sunlight can reach the bottom of the ocean, but it is particularly common in the shallow sea between Yama and Kupchai. Genetic ancestor, Basio Magno. Scientific name, Xenosargassum pupera. Average height, at their tallest, Sargrasso stalks can get to 40 centimeters. 
Now we come to the Violet Tree. These towering retinal fights might be considered the earliest spectacle on this prehistoric land of Almaisha. They truly might be the spark that leads heterotrophs out of the water. Creature Design by Random Evil Times The Violet Trees are rather similar to their wartmelon ancestors, besides growing to megafloral sizes. They have a bulb that stores nutrients, rhizoids coming out of said bulb, three leaves that serve reproductive and energy-gathering purposes, a sphincter-like organ that uses water pressure inside the cavity cells to expel spores inside the leaf, a stem that has an extra reinforced cuticle like an earth tree, and spores that have multiple non-conjoining filaments that float through the air like a dandelion seed that are made out of the same material as the cuticle. They still use parthenogenesis occasionally, but mainly use a novel sexual reproduction method to produce new organisms. At the beginning of the monsoon season, they release large quantities of male spores, which are small, only 3 millimeters in diameter, which will hopefully land on the funnel-shaped leaves of another violet tree and go inside the other tree's sphincter and fertilize the much larger 7 centimeter female spores inside. After fertilization, the spores are ejected using their dandelion-like heads to fly off far away from their mother and grow from just being a stem with a single leaf to a full tree at three local years, which is when they form and then release their own spores. They are restricted to coastal regions all around Kubshai. In order to survive dry seasons on Almaisha, violet trees begin to slow their metabolism down, and before it hits, they store extra energy to survive the upcoming drought. Genetic Ancestor? Wartmelon. Scientific name? Retinal dendron spermatrix. Origin? Retinal phyta. Lifespan? 15 local years. Average height? 130 centimeters. Alright, and last but not least, we have Terabasio. Terabasio has evolved to survive in the driest of areas where life is possible at this point. They can survive here due to the extremely fast growth rates, lack of proper competition, and ability to enter cryptobiosis during droughts. Picture a stand of Terabasio quickly absorbing as much water as it can after a rare night of rain in the dry lands of eastern equatorial Kubshai. The sun is up and the wet ground is already drying. Terabasio has three main subspecies that are slowly diverging from each other in major ways. The main group live around the dry regions of equatorial Kubshai to the east of the central mountains. This group is mostly evolved to live in the wet tropics and have grown noticeably taller than their kin in other areas, up to one meter. Another group of Terabasio lives in the east of Kupshai. They dot the landscape of the tropics and the low-lying areas of the savannas. They grow to about 50 centimeters. Last is the newest of all Terabasio subspecies. Their seeds have been carried over the shallow sea by the currents and have started to evolve slowly from their original form into something new. They grow up to 60 centimeters and have bigger stems with tougher skins to deal with the substantially longer dry periods on Yama. Creature Design by Kipzillo Terabasio is made up of three parts, the tuber, the roots, and the leaves. The tuber is the storage compartment of the Terabasio. As it lives through the wet seasons, it will use around 40% of its resources for growth and another 60% for storage. In the tuber, it stores liquids in the deepest parts. Around the liquids, it stores carbohydrates, and around those, there's a strong rigid skin that doesn't let any liquids evaporate from inside. The stem is the connective part between the tuber and the plant's six leaves, which grow from the stem. Most of the stem will die off when dry seasons or droughts roll in. Only the bottommost part will not fall off. After the dry season, the plant will regrow the stem. The leaves are long, oval-shaped, and are semi-rigid. They have a central vein running through it which splits off into smaller side capillaries. They are the primary producing part of the plant, and are shaped in such a way that when water starts to fall on them, they will redirect it towards the tuber. The leaves will start to discolor when the plant goes into hibernation and will fall off after a while, to reduce transportation costs and conserve resources. The roots are the anchor of the plant. They grow from one central thick root that grows straight down. They gather water and nutrients from the ground and have to be submerged for 95% of the time or the plant will die off. Terabasio can reproduce asexually. It expands by vegetative propagation. It sends new shoots through the substrate, which will then start to swell into a small tuber. Eventually, when the tuber is large enough, it will send up a new stem. Terabasio can also produce via spore. This it makes on the point where the leaf and stem connect to each other. These will then get blown away by strong winds to around 10 to 15 meters. On the place it lands, it will grow a new tuber and set root, after which it will develop into a new plant. Terabasio grows over the course of about 60 local days into a plant that can reproduce. They usually start growing after the first rains in the wet season, and only stop when it has been dry for over two weeks. When this happens, they will quickly lose their leaves and go into cryptobiosis. Terabasio can grow on every bit of land where there is at least a wet season of four months long and a groundwater table that is less than 15 meters deep. Terabasio stays active when the climate and weather is wet, and goes into cryptobiosis when there has been no rainfall in two weeks. When this happens, it will lose all of its leaves and rest until new rain falls. Genetic Ancestor? Basio Magno. Scientific name? Magnotuberus terabasio. Origin, retinal phyta. Lifespan, 20 years. Average height, 60 centimeters. All right, and that does it for this update. I will be getting out the next one as soon as I can, and I am also announcing that on March 11th, I will be closing new submissions. Any submission that comes in, 
even on the midnight after, will be automatically disregarded. That also means that if I haven't gotten back to you regarding your submission yet, it doesn't necessarily mean it's rejected. However, if it doesn't meet the qualifications after March 11th, and I haven't had time to work with you to correct them, I'm going to have to actually not accept it. So please double check all of your submissions, check them for spelling, grammar, even punctuation, just to make sure everything is perfect. Because if it gets past March 11th and I'm looking through submissions and they don't meet the requirements, I'm just going to have to automatically reject them. I wish I didn't have to do this, but we are getting a lot more submissions than even last time, which itself was already a little bit on the overwhelming side. So there has to be some way for me to weed through them. All right, well, thank you for watching. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. I'd like to just take a moment to thank my channel members and patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above, Ben Tobin, Ian Chen, Chris Love, Sphincter of Doom, and The Venerable Bee. My channel members and patrons help make this a much more stable income, because as you might know, ad income varies wildly from month to month, even with the same number of views. And it really helps this channel stay on the air. But if a monthly pledge or a yearly pledge, which I have now activated, isn't right for you, there's a merch store linked in the description, and every like, share, and subscription really helps the channel grow. Also, starting this month, those pledging $10 or above will have access to free 3D art assets, including materials and models, which will be made for Blender by me and can be used in any project without crediting me. <laughs>